This is a picture test in practical anatomy. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer and listen to the comments and explanations. Injury of which of the nerves A to C results in this hand deformity? This is a claw hand deformity resulting from a long-standing injury of the ulnar nerve. The small muscles of the hand are paralyzed, except the thinner muscles and the first two lumbricals, which are supplied by the median nerve. Adduction of the thumb is lost because of paralysis of adductor pollicis, supplied by the ulnar nerve. Paralysis of the interosseous muscles causes extension of the metacarpophalangeal joint and flexion of the interphalangeal joints. That's to say, clawing, which is the reverse of their action. This clawing is produced by the action of the long digital flexors and extensors whose bellies are present in the forearm. Clawing is most prominent in the fifth and fourth fingers, as you can see here, because the lumbricals of these fingers are, and not only the enterosei, are also supplied by the ulnar nerve thus resulting in paralysis of the both lumbricals and interosei related to the fourth and fifth digits, and clawing is more pronounced in these digits. Now returning back to the dissection, it shows a view of the axilla, showing the axillary artery, cords, and branches of the brachial plexus, the pectoral muscles, pectoralis major and pectoralis minor, are reflected up. In order to identify the branches A, B, and C, let's try to find the capital M configuration of the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus and their terminal branches. This will serve as a clue for the brachial plexus. This is the lateral cord of the brachial plexus located lateral to the axillary artery and it has two terminal branches, the musculocutaneous nerve that passes through coracobrachialis muscle and the lateral root of the median nerve. This lateral root of the median nerve unites with the medial root of the median nerve which comes from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. So this is medial cord of the brachial plexus which is medial to the axillary artery, and the medial cord has another terminal branch, and that is the ulnar nerve. So here's the letter M, and now we can sort out the branches A, B, and C. A is the musculocutaneous nerve, B is the median nerve, and C is the ulnar nerve. So it is injury of nerve C, the ulnar nerve, that is responsible for this claw hand deformity. Identify the muscle A, what is its nerve supply, and identify the artery B, which palmar arch it mainly contribute to. This is a view of the dorsolateral aspect of the wrist where the anatomical snub box is located. The tendons of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis bound the anatomical snub box anteriorly. Remember that in the anatomical description, we always consider the body positioned in the anatomical position. So this is the anterior side in the anatomical position. And also in the anatomical position, the tendon of extensor pollicis longus here bounds the anatomical snuff box posteriorly. Note that the tendons of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, they lie in the most lateral compartment beneath the extensor retinaculum. Here, the extensor retinaculum is partially removed. This is the remaining part of the extensor retinaculum, but it is removed from this location, exposing its lateral compartments. Now, the next compartment that extends to the dorsal tubercle allows the tendons of extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis to pass. So tendon A is the tendon of extensor carpi radialis longus, 
which is attached to the base of the second metacarpal bone. The brevis extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon is attached to the base of the third metacarpal bone and it is located more medially. Also note here that the groove on the medial side of the dorsal tubercle lodges the tendon of extensor pollicis longus where the tendon changes its direction against the dorsal tubercle of the radius. Now this muscle, A, extensor carpi radialis longus, being an extensor muscle, it is supplied by the radial nerve. The radial nerve spirals in the posterior compartment of the arm to appear at the lateral side of the anterior compartment of the arm proximal to the elbow. Here it lies between brachialis on one side and brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus on the other side, supplying both these muscles. The artery that can be seen in the floor of the anatomical snuff box and its pulsations felt in the living is the radial artery. The radial artery in the flexor compartment of the forearm curves laterally to be in the place where it is marked here. Now from this position the radial artery enters the palm by passing between the two heads of the first dorsal interosseous muscle here. Remember that the dorsal interossei are bicipital and have two heads. The artery then passes between the two heads of adductor pollicis muscle and it appears in the palm. And we can see it here in this dissection where the long flexor tendons are removed. The radial artery will form the deep palmar arch after uniting with the deep branch of the ulnar artery. But it's the radial artery that's the main contributor of the deep palmar arterial arch. Which anatomical structure is involved in this deformity? Thickening of a fibrous digital sheath produces stenosis of the osseofibrous tunnel. So it is the fibrous flexor sheaths that are involved in this deformity. The thickening is the result of repetitive forceful use of the fingers. The tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus are entrapped in the tunnel and the person is unable to extend the finger. And when the finger is extended passively, a snap is audible and inflection produces another snap. Clinically, it is called snapping finger or trigger finger. It is labeled trigger finger because when the finger unlocks, that's to say it is extended, it pops back suddenly as if releasing a trigger of a gun. Identify the nerves from which each of the branches A to C originate. This is a superficial dissection of the hand showing the cutaneous nerves. The superficial branch of the radial nerve can be seen at the roof of the anatomical snuff box and it supplies the lateral side of the dorsum of the hand and the lateral three and a half digits proximal to the nail beds. So A is derived from the superficial branch of the radial nerve. The median nerve in the palm, apart from motor branches like this one, recurrent branch of the median nerve, the median nerve sends cutaneous sensory fibers, digital branches, and these are sent to the adjacent sides of the lateral three and a half digits. Considering this, B is a digital branch of the median nerve supplying the radial side of the ring finger. It should be mentioned that at the tips of the fingers, the digital branches on the palmar side bend dorsally and supply the nail beds and parts of the dorsal surfaces of the fingers as well. The ulnar nerve in the palm divides into superficial and deep branches. This is the superficial branch of the ulnar nerve. You can see how it enters the palm superficial to the flexor retinaculum, lateral to the pisiform bone, and medial to the ulnar artery. And you can see here again that the superficial branch divides to, to supply adjacent sides of the one and a half fingers, medial one and a half fingers here. So C is a branch of the ulnar nerve supplying the ulnar side of the ring finger. Of course, there is another branch here which is not shown in the dissection and it supplies the ulnar side of the little finger.
it should be mentioned that the exact cutaneous areas on the hand are subject to variation and overlap. Identify the fibrous structure A and the muscle B. This is the thickening of the deep fascia of the palm. The deep fascia of the palm is thin over the thinner and hypothenar eminences, but is thick in the central part of the palm where it forms the palmar aponeurosis. The palmar aponeurosis is generally triangular in shape. The distal end of the aponeurosis divides at the roots of the fingers into four bands. The bands pass to the fingers, each is fused with the fibrous flexor sheath of that finger. The palmar aponeurosis is firmly attached to the overlying skin, thus improving the grip. In addition, the palmar aponeurosis it sends deep septa that divides the palm into facial spaces which limit the spread of infection. The tendon attached to the apex of the palmar aponeurosis belongs to a muscle of the flexor compartment of the forearm. It is the palmaris longus muscle of the superficial group of the flexor muscles of the forearm. This muscle is characterized by a short belly and a long tendon that passes superficial to the flexor retinaculum and is attached to the palmar aponeurosis. The tendon may be absent in some people, although its function is negligible, but it's clinically useful as it might be used for tendon grafting elsewhere in the body. Identify the muscle A, name the fibrous tissue located at its distal end. This is a tendon of extensor digitorum muscle. The muscle belly divides into four tendons, one for each of the fingers, and note here that the tendons of extensor digitorum are bound together on the back of the hand by tendinous slips. These tendinous slips make it difficult to extend the ring finger alone from a clenched fist. On the distal end of the metacarpals and along the phalanges, the extensor tendons flatten to form the extensor expansion. Each digital extensor expansion is triangular aponeurosis that wraps around the dorsum and sides of the head of a metacarpal bone and the proximal phalanx. The extensor expansion then divides into a median band that passes to the base of the middle phalanx and two lateral bands that extend to the base of the distal phalanx. Match each numbered statement with a lettered carpal bone shown in the x-ray. Has a hook. A hook is a characteristic feature of the hamate, the most medial of the second row of carpal bones, and that is B. Two is the earliest to ossify. Carpal bones start ossification after birth in a sequence that is governed by their size in which the largest is the first to ossify and the smallest is the last to ossify, which is the pisiform bone. Now the largest carpal bone here is the capitate bone, which is D, and it is the first bone to be ossified. Three is the most commonly fractured. The most commonly fractured carpal bone is the scaphoid, which is the most lateral of the first row of carpal bones that articulates with the radius, and it is E. Actually, you can see here that it, it is already fractured. Fracture of the scaphoid results in tenderness in the anatomical snuff box, where the scaphoid forms part of the floor of the anatomical snuff box. Four is the most commonly dislocated. The most commonly dislocated carpal bone is the lunate bone and it is located in the first row of carpal bones, articulates with the radius, as well as the scaphoid, to form the wrist joint, and it is C, the lunate. Five is considered as a sesamoid bone in the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. The carpal bone that is considered to be a sesamoid bone in the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris is the pisiform bone. It is the most medial of the first row of carpal bones. Flexor carpi ulnaris is attached to the pisiform bone and from which pisohamate and pisometacarpal ligaments carry the insertion more distally. 